Good morning. Everyone. Sorry, Good morning. technical stuff there. Hey, thanks for joining us again. Um, I see definitely one new face. So let's just go around again. Um, Katie, if you're able to talk, I know sometimes you can't, then just um, shout out. Um, but Katie's online with us again. Um, we normally just go around and do a quick introduction of just names and um, how long you've been here so people have get an idea of what who we've got in the room and um, what's brought, brought you here today. Um, for those that are new, uh, this is a six week, we call it class, but um, really we want this to be a community discussion. Um, it, it's really for anybody that wants to learn more about the Episcopal Church, uh, a little bit about Christianity if you're new to church life, um, and, and St. John's. Um, so um, it works well for new people. Um, and please feel free to ask questions. This is an opportunity for you to get to know us and us to get to know you. Um, today, Craig is going to be talking about, let me get this perfectly right, Episcopal temperament, <laughs> and um, he did ask us to watch. My name is Paulie Murray, um, so he'll be asking questions. <laughs> this is a place of grace, <laughs> so you can confess your sins. If you didn't watch, my name is Paulie Murray. You are forgiven. I was too busy listening to the resume podcast. Of oh, oh, so much homework, right, yeah. Eliza? Oh, it's learning me. And as I've said before, this is a casual environment, so please do feel free to. Get up, help yourself to what you need. There's bathrooms down the hallway on the right. And every week I try and bring you a little something to help you get connected. So this week I brought our magazine. Do you want a copy of it? Or do you get one in the post? Um, I'm going to, do you get one for in the, in the mail? Okay, get this one. Okay, well, one proper vehicle. Well, 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 maybe it's on. I'm going to run out, but I will. Oh, you don't have to run out. Can you do it? Chris, if you like one. Sure. So this is our magazine that we bring, we um, publish every other month. Oh, I have. Awesome. And um, it isn't really like your uh, church um, newsletter. We try and do more theological and reflective type pieces in there. Um, not so much of your what's happening and and stuff. We have. A weekly e newsletter for that. This is we try and keep this more like pieces of interest um, that might spur a little deeper thinking. Um, so if you want to get on the mailing list for this, let me know. And uh, with that, let's go around. So I'm Sarah, parish administrator. I've been here 10 years now, and I am here. Um, Pat Lewis is actually coordinator for access and connection, and they normally would lead um, these groups and be your primary person, but they're taking um, some a break, well-deserved break at the moment. And so I'm covering for them. Um, and that's why I'm here, but I enjoy it anyway. I normally tag along and support them in their work. Awesome. Uh, my name is Heather Bender, and this is my fourth time here. My name is Matthew. I've been here for 10 years. I'm Chris. Um, I've been coming here off and on since 2018, I think. My name is Shelby, and this is my third time here. And I'm Barb Tani. I've pr probably been here about five years. I'm a membership liaison with the vestry. Oh, I'm Thompson. I've been living in St. Paul. This will be my second year. I've been here three times this meeting. Hello, Mackenzie Friendwood. I've been attending since about 2021, but before that, um, kind of off and on in 2015. Eliza, 2018. And Craig, I started in the choir way back in 2009. Mm -hmm. And then I left for a while to become a priest. And then I came back as the associate director in 2018. Mm -hmm. And Katie, we'll give you, if you want to say anything, shout up. Otherwise, we will shout out. Otherwise, yeah. Yes. Yay. Can you can you hear me? Yes. 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 All right, cool. Hi, everybody. I'm Katie Nickel. I am sitting here in the lobby of my apartment because 
because I've got a sick dog. Um, I have been coming to St. John's on and off um, probably since 2017 or 2018. Um, this summer tried starting to come more intentionally and more regularly. And I'm excited to be part of this class. That's Thanks. all. Thank you, Katie. And with that, pass over to Freddie. Thanks, Sarah. So good morning, everyone. Today, and we'll start with the first slide. Um, we're talking about Episcopal temperament. <laughs> And I'm using some sources that I think all of you should maybe get to know. So the first is the Anglican Spirit by the Archbishop of Canterbury way back in the day. Um, Michael Ramsey was the Archbishop of Canterbury in 1961. And he's a contemporary of <clears throat> Paul Murray, who was born, as we see, it's not a joke. Oh, yeah. <laughs> we might not be. Oh, dear. So, Sarah. Oh, there we go. <laughs> oh, why isn't it advancing? Like Whenever this? you leave, Sarah, we'll like that. that. Sorry. It's, yep. it's not advancing. I, yeah, I know. Okay. Oh. I'm going to do that for you. Be great. Just when I'm close to that. Polymar is 1910 to 1985. So, the Archbishop of Canterbury during that time was Michael Ramsey. And the Anglican spirit is basically talking about what the spirit of Anglicanism is all about. So I'll pass this, these around. The next is What is Anglicanism by Urban Holmes. He was the Dean of the Seminary of the South at Suwani. So he helps the Episcopal Church take the global Anglican communion, sort of the Anglican spirit for the whole global Anglican communion, the Archbishop of Canterbury being sort of the main convener of all the bishops in the Anglican world. Urban Holmes helps bring this into the Episcopal Church in the United States. And again, he was a contemporary of Paulie Murray. So that's the other source I'll be referring to. And lastly is this tiny but very powerful book called A People Called Episcopalians, A Brief Introduction to Our Way of Life by John Westerhoff and Sharon Evie Pearson. And I'm focusing mainly on the fifth chapter, which is titled, guess what? Episcopal temperament. <laughs> and this is actually going to give us a framework for the presentation on Pauli Murray, where we'll look at aspects of Episcopal temperament that's grounded in the Anglican spirit. So it's comprehensive, it's ambiguous, it's open-minded, it's intuitive, it's aesthetic, it's moderate, it's naturalistic, it's historical, it's political, it's all those things. So pause that around and you can see those categories. And what I think makes these very abstract ideas come alive is a real human. My favorite Episcopal saint, Pauli Murray. Pauli Murray was a poet, a writer, an activist, a labor organizer, a legal theorist, a lawyer, a professor, an Episcopal priest, an Episcopal saint, and an intersectional icon. <clears throat> learn a little bit about intersectionality in a moment, but let's confess our sins, which is good for the soul who did not watch My Name is Pauli Murray. <laughs> you are absolved, God loves you. You are <clears throat> ransomed, healed, restored, and forgiven. I wrote it down to watch. That's as far as I got. Oh, what? Well, <laughs> that's a little part. I, 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 I had confess it then. I watched it, but... I was extremely tired. I had been my son's birthday party, so I kept on falling asleep. You observed and it. I tried to wake up, and I was like, "Come on, Heather, this is your homework." It's okay. You are subconscious to. I'm going work. to. I, I, I was very interested, so I'm going to actually rewatch it when I'm not super tired and <laughs> all day. Yes. Yes. Good. That's my plan. Oh, I would, I would love to watch it, but it's a great, Amazon Prime. Yeah, um, yes, yeah, yes. and I might be, I'm not sure, it might be on YouTube, but Amazon Prime is where it was. There are also some good... books about her wonderful life. Yes, yeah. the good news is, I'm going to play the trailer to the film. So oh, shog our memories. So let's go to the next slide, where I think I thought was on my next slide. <laughs> okay, it is the trailer. Oh, good. So while we're getting that, thank you, Barb. They are fabulous books. The first I'm going to refer to is Song in a Weary Throat 
Yes. This book was written by Pauline Murray. Mm -hmm. However, as fabulous as this biography is, there is a hiatus. There's something missing that Paulie could not talk about mm -hmm. in 1985 when oh. this was published. Mm -hmm. So Song in a Weary Throat, we can pass that around. And that hiatus is taken care of by Rosalind Rosenberg in her book, Jane Crow. Mm -hmm. Rosalind Rosenberg goes into Paulie Murray's private medical papers and discovers that Paulie wrestled with an existential self-understanding as a male essence in a female form. Oh. What we now have terminology to describe. So Rosalind Rosenberg does faithful and tender work in looking at this important aspect of who Polly Murray was in Jim Crow. And lastly, one of my favorite books is by Patricia Bell Scott, the Firebrand and the First Lady, A Portrait of a Friendship, Polly Murray, Eleanor Roosevelt, and the Struggle for Social Justice. And if you want to learn about solidarity between two strong women of completely different contexts who came together in love around their shared Episcopal temperament, the things we're going to talk about, they both shared a deep devotion to the Episcopal temperament. So this is a great book to refer to as well. And lastly, Pauli Murray, as I said, was a poet throughout Pauli's life. Pauli was writing fantastic poetry that Pauli published and worked through a lot of the struggles, the social justice struggles that Pauli fought for through creative writing and poems. So let's watch the trailer because our sins have been forgiven. <laughs> okay. Before we jump into that, Katie says, I watched and one of my employees at the homeless shelter said, thank you for sharing this. Oh, great. great. And then Katie, just so you know, um, since we've watched it, I'm actually running two different slideshows because it's hard to, to share what the people are here are watching. So if you don't mind, um, I'm going to run the one that people here can see. You'll hear the sound, but it won't play the um, pictures if, if you don't mind, Vince, if you have seen it. There are some people who now argue that you cannot teach American history without teaching about Pauli Murray. Pauli was a writer, a lawyer, a priest, a poet. Pauli was a feisty woman. My name is Pauli Murray. My whole history has been a struggle in a society dominated by the ideas that blacks were inferior to whites and women were inferior to men. Well, he was way ahead of the times. I chose for my senior paper, should Plessy versus Ferguson be overruled? My little argument went to the Supreme Court. Y'all see all of the different folks that are in this room? That is made possible by Holly Murray. If you rip away everything, oppression is the business of not respecting one's personhood. For my first two years, I was the only woman in the law school. And they didn't even let me talk. Thurgood Marshall is talking about Jim Crow. And she says, what I'm experiencing is Jane Crow. Polly Murray was not just an amazing lawyer or a badass feminist, but also a queer non-binary person. Sitting in front of Murray's notes, the turmoil and the suffering this is a feeling I know well. Scholars who have written about Polly largely still use feminine pronouns. I don't know what pronouns Polly would say. Trans and gender non-binary people have always been a part of our American context. So did y'all just think that your generation invented it? But if this country is to survive, we must live together in harmony. Holly may not have realized they would be a beacon for so many folks. Holly's time had not come. We have to work for a world in which it does come. You say I can't, I'll show you I can, even if I die trying. So, oh. 
concrete embodiment of there are some people who now argue that you cannot teach American history. Temperament is really um, made real in Holly Murray's life. And I need this book back because I can't remember what order these <laughs> aspects of Anglicanism are going to be moving to. So the first one that we're going to talk about is comprehensiveness. So who can see the screen and read this first quote? Mm. Can anyone see the screen? I can. Yes. Yes. Okay, yes. please read. <laughs> We, uh, we often speak of Anglican comprehensiveness. If this is a way of making relative relativism palatable or a means of accommodating all shades of opinion with no regard for truth, then it needs to be rejected. If by comprehensive, we mean the, pr the priority of a dialectic quest over precision and immediate closure, then we are speaking of the Anglican consciousness at its best. Thank you. So the priority of a dialectic quest. We, as Episcopalians, love questions. We do not do dogma. We do not do doctrine wholesale. We apply faithful, critical thinking as a spiritual discipline. And we refine that dialectic quest. We don't just accept things because we're told to accept them. We want to go deep into why we believe what we believe. Next slide. Holy Mary, being a comprehensive embodiment of this Anglican approach to consciousness and comprehensiveness, is an intersectional person. So next person to please read this quote. <laughs> Let's go that way. I'll just call on you, Chris. Perfect. Intersectionality is the complex, cumulative way in which the effects of multiple forms of discrimination, such as racism, sexism, heterosexism, and classism, combine, overlap, or intersect, especially in the experiences of marginalized individuals or groups. And Kimberly Crenshaw. Thank you. Kimberly Crenshaw introduced the theory of intersectionality in 1989. The idea that when it comes to thinking about how inequality persists, categories like gender, race, and class are best understood as overlapping and mutually constitutive yep. uh, rather than isolated and distinct. Great. So this is 1989. 89 that intersectionality became a defined concept in the academy through Kimberly Crenshaw. But as we'll soon see, Pauli Murray was doing this way back in the day because Pauli died in 1985 before this theory was published. So next slide, we'll see that um, Pauli Murray refused to be fragmented into these like categories that the colonizer loves to place us in and then you know, make us suspicious uh, across our lines of difference. So Pauli says, I hate to be fragmented into Negro at one time, woman at another, and worker at another. Pauli was a comprehensive human that refused to be pulled apart into these categories by a racist and sexist and classist system. So next slide. The next category of Episcopal temperament is ambiguity, right? We need uh, a, a, a person who can read this quote if you wanna get closer to the screen. This is a wonderful quote that I love from Rainer Maria Wilco. You probably know it well. Um, Shelby, can you see? It's like uh, an eye test. <laughs> Be patient toward all that is unsolved in your heart and try to love the questions themselves. Like locked rooms and like books that are now written in a very foreign tongue. Do not seek the do not now seek the answers, which cannot be given to you because you would not be able to live them. And the point is to live everything, live the questions now. Perhaps you will then gradually, without noticing it, live along some distant day into the answer. Thank you. Oh. Beautiful quote in his letters to a young poet. And the next slide, we're going to see how Pauli was a living unanswered question. So we play this video. Mm. 
I discovered Polly Murray in the 1970s, uh, reading some of her essays in the collections of feminist writings that were being published in those years, <laughs> and in getting to know Ruth Bader Ginsburg, who was the first female professor at Columbia Law School when I was a new assistant professor of history at, at Columbia. And being interested in the 14th Am Amendment, uh, I learned from Ruth Bader Ginsburg the importance of Polly Murray to extending the rights of women uh, through her own work. I started working on this uh, life of Polly Murray as a biography in the 1990s. I had originally intended to write a book on the 14th Amendment, but when Polly Murray's papers were opened at the Schlesinger Library at Harvard, I realized that there was a, a rich story to be told uh, about her life, and both her public and her private life, as a way of understanding the 14th Amendment and how it evolved over many decades. The, the primary influence on me in writing this biography was Polly Murray's own work. She, uh, the last two years of her life, she uh, wrote a, a memoir which she began to call Jane Crow, but after her death, her editors named Song in a Weary Throat, which was taken from one of her poems. And Polly Murray was not only a civil rights activist and feminist and lawyer, she was also a, a poet and a priest. Uh, but reading that memoir uh, made me realize how many different parts of 20th century American history uh, could be illuminated by telling her uh, her life. But I also believed that there were parts of her life she was not touching at all, because the, the memoir, wonderful as it is, is, is not as deeply reflective as the first family history that she wrote back in the 1950s, uh, principally about her, her grandparents there was something that she was hiding. And it wasn't until I uh, got deep into her papers that I realized that what she was hiding were her personal struggles, her private struggles over gender identity. My thinking about Murray did change over the course of the, the project. Uh, when I first began to read her papers, I, and this was about 1997, uh, I came across medical papers that she had very carefully saved. And at first I thought that she was saying that her principal struggle was with sexual orientation, that she, she was a lesbian at a time when it was very difficult to be open about one's sexual orientation. But as I kept going back and reading again, and as I read further, I realized that she didn't think of herself as a lesbian. She thought of herself as a heterosexual male in a female body. And that added a layer of complexity to her, to her, her life that I thought was very important because as hard as it was to be a lesbian in the 1930s and 40s, it was uh, much more difficult to be what we would now call someone struggling with a transgender identity because the term didn't exist. Uh, no social movement existed to support her. The, the most that she could look to was the writings on sex, sexology that uh, were printed in the early part of the 20th century. And her favorite author was Havelock Ellis, who argued that there were some people who were pseudo-hermaphrodites people who had the external characteristics of one sex, but the internal characteristics of another. And she was convinced that that was who, who she was. So ambiguity is in Polly Murray's body, and ambiguity is in our Episcopal temperament. We approach ambiguity with reverence. The next category, which is on the next slide, which I, <laughs> the next category is, okay. I think it's open-minded or intuitive. No, it's a quote by Urban Holmes. <laughs> so let's have somebody who can see the screen read Urban Holmes' uh, quote, if you can see it. 
Barb or Paulino you know, McKenzie. I'll come closer. Okay, yeah. thanks, Barb. <laughs> the ability to uh, apprehend or incorporate into our awareness the totality of an experience in all the depth and breadth and breadth. Sensibility refers to the capacity to be sensitive to accept what our senses tell us, even when that is not what fits into our neat categories. It implies an openness to experience, even when the meaning of that experience is ambiguous, incongruous, and obscure. Thank you. <laughs> As Episcopalians, like Poli Mari, who was trying to be crammed into categories that Poli was like, absolutely not. That is not who I am. I'm not a woman. You cannot categorize me as such. That when we don't fit into these neat categories that the colonizer has told us that you need to be crammed into in order to belong, we say, actually, no, no, I have senses. I have a way of telling you who I am from my essence. And that requires a deep discernment of knowing who you are as a beloved child of God, made in God's divine image, not in the image of a category that you're trying to be crammed into. Next slide. Open-mindedness. So F. Scott, have you heard the story about F. Scott Fitzgerald in this church? No. no. Nope. Christmas Eve, F. Scott Fitzgerald had a lot to drink to celebrate the birth of our Lord. <laughs> and stumbles into our sanctuary here at St. John the Evangelist Episcopal Church on the corner of Kent and Portland during the sermon, stumbles to the front of the church and says something fabulous and interrupts the sermon. And then he like stumbles out in his drunken mess to his apartment, which is just the red brick buildings over there on Summit Avenue by our parking lot. He stumbled back home. <laughs> but we've got this lovely quote from F. Scott Fitzgerald from the crack up. Can somebody read this? Maybe for me. I have to go closer. I'm okay. going to the eye doctor in December. <laughs> the test of a first rate intelligence is the ability to hold two opposed ideas in the mind at the same time and still retain the ability to function. <laughs> Great. So we don't do binaries. The Episcopal temperament is both and. We don't do either or, we don't do black and white. We do all the colors in the kaleidoscopic spectrum of humanity. Next slide. Okay, so Polly, Polly went through it. We'll start, we'll start with race. Polly applies to the University of North Carolina and is rejected with a letter that states under the laws of North Carolina and under the resolutions of the Board of Trustees of the University of North Carolina, members of your race are not admitted to the university. <clears throat> and this was in 1938. Uh, Pauli Murray receives this rejection, even though Pauli Murray is a brilliant scholar. Next slide. So Pauli is done and decides to go to law school at Howard University in Washington, D.C. And this is the quote that I love. So, Mackenzie, if you would read this. These infuriating reminders that one could not escape Jim Crow, even in cosmopolitan New York City, erased any lingering doubts I had about suppressing my urge to write in favor of becoming a civil rights lawyer. I went to Washington to enter law school with the single-minded intention of destroying Jim Crow. The single-minded intention of destroying Jim Crow. As you can see in this photo, and maybe you can't because you're far away, Pauli Murray is the only woman in her class. All of the men in her class, while they are all black, like Pauli, are male. And Pauli experiences, as you heard, Jane Crow. So next slide. Pauli Murray not only rises to the top of her class, even though she's ignored, mocked, and ridiculed by her professor and her colleagues in law school at Howard University, she graduates top of her class. And her final paper is so brilliant that it's Thurgood Marshall who uses Pauli Murray's final paper to argue against Plessy versus Ferguson in Board of, of Education that literally destroyed Jim Crow. And that was Pauli Murray's legal architecture, her brilliant legal mind that 
that Thurgood Marshall and his team had to rely on. Mm -hmm. The tradition at Howard was if you were at the top of your class in the law school, you went to Harvard to do your doctorate in jurisprudence as a lawyer. Mm -hmm. But Harvard writes, you are not of the sex entitled to be admitted to Harvard Law School. And I love this rejoinder. Sarah, can you see this? Mm -hmm. This is what Paulie writes to the Harvard Law School. Gentlemen, I would gladly change my sex to meet your requirements. But since the way to such change has not been revealed to me, I have no recourse but to appeal to you to change your minds on the subject. Are you to tell me that one is as difficult as the other? <laughs> So Paulie fights back um, because Paulie is now Jane Crow. It's not only race, it's race and gender. So the next slide. Intuition is another aspect in Episcopal temperament. So I guess we're back here. <laughs> the, intu I'm sorry. the intuitive mind is a sacred gift and the rational mind is a faithful servant. We have created a society that honors the servant and has forgotten the gift. Right. In the Western culture, we have idolized purely intellectual ways of being. Reason trumps intuition in this culture. So the Episcopal temperament is saying it's a both and, it's head and heart. It's that place where your intellect and your heart intersect at the lump in your throat. This is a theologian, Kimberly Bradney, who taught me at United Seminary that when you're having a true religious experience, the truth that is setting you free, it's when your mind and your heart intersect at that lump in your throat. We do intuition. We don't do pure reason. We don't do pure emotionality. We do an intuitive connection of both mind and gut. Next slide. So intuition is what leads Polly Murray to her vocation to become a priest. The woman on the right is her namesake, Aunt Pauline. Polly Murray was orphaned at eight years old. She witnessed her mother suffer a massive cerebral hemorrhage on the steps of their home and watched her mother die in front of her. Her father, trying to keep the family together actually becomes mentally ill. And then he's admitted to Crownsville Hospital for the Negro Insane. And Paulie is orphaned. And it is her aunt Pauline on the right who raises Paulie as if Paulie was her daughter. Aunt Pauline let Paulie be who Paulie was. My little boy girl is what Aunt Pauline called Paulie Murray. Mm -hmm. Paulie refused to wear dresses. So when they went to this clothing store, Aunt Pauline let Polly go to the boys' section to pick out Polly's clothes. With the exception that when they went to the Episcopal Church every Sunday, Polly would wear a dress and Polly agreed. So Aunt Pauline, when Aunt Pauline is dying, the priest can't come. The priest is busy. And there's this moment where Polly trusts her gut intuition and she opens up Aunt Pauline's prayer book to the ministration to the dying. And she reads the rite from the prayer book. And as she finishes the rite and prays with her aunt, Aunt Pauline dies. And that's when Pauline realizes something happened in this moment where I prayed for my dying aunt. Maybe I'm called to something else. I'm a poet, I'm a lawyer, but something else just happened with the death of her for all intents and purposes, her mother. And then there's Rini. Irene Barlow was the love of Paulie's life. Irene worked at the same law firm as Paulie, and they used to go to lunch together. And at one luncheon, something came out of both of their mouths that is directly from the Book of Common Prayer. You know how Episcopalians, we say beautiful Cranarian English every Sunday, the language just kind of came off of one of their tongues during lunch. And they were like, wait, are you an Episcopalian? And she's like, yes, I'm an Episcopalian. And then they decided to go to Wednesday Eucharist at St. Bartholomew's on Fifth Avenue in New York City. Every Wednesday, they would go to mass together. And Paulie and Reen 
were done with the fact that men were the only ones allowed to be seen. Preaching, celebrating, acolyting, all of the visible things were men, but the actual work that needs the church to run was by women behind the scenes. And Rini was having none of it and Paulie was having none of it. So they started this campaign, which actually used the canons of their diocesan convention to go to the general convention here in Minneapolis in 1977 to vote that women should have access to ordination in the Episcopal Church. And sure enough, Holy Mary becomes the first woman who is Black ordained as a priest in the global Anglican community. So Rini was the love of Holy's life, trusted that intuition, that deep love that they shared, and Aunt Pauline, um, the intuition she trusted when she prayed the ministration to the dying, again, led her to the vocation of being a priest. So next slide. <laughs> A beautiful quote from when Paulie becomes a priest. Uh, where are we? Matthew, if you're able to read, or Chris, <laughs> depending on who has the better eyesight. <laughs> Here's a quote from Song in a Weary Throat, if you can see it. Careful. I have sway always, yeah. Okay. As I struggle with the racial and sexual conflicts of that period, I clung to the twofold legacy left to the world in the 1960s, the life and the work, respectively, of Eleanor Roosevelt and Martin Luther King Jr. Each in different ways had emphasized the moral and spiritual imperatives of ungaunting struggle for human dignity and had demonstrated the power and love to transcend divisions of race, sex, or class. Pondering the source of their influence on their times led me to reflect more deeply upon the meaning of the Christian faith. Thank you, Matthew. So, Holy really finds healing across all of the lines of difference intersecting in Paulie's body in Christ. We read in Ephesians and Galatians, in Christ there is neither male nor female. There is neither Jew nor Greek. There is neither slave nor free. For we are all one in Christ Jesus. So the next slide is aesthetics, all of the beauty of holiness that we love in the Episcopal Church. Um, the music the language, the architecture, the icons, all of that, right, is part of how we worship God in the Episcopal Church. So, Chris, a quote from Goethe. A person should hear a little music, read a little poetry, and see a fine picture every day of their life in order that worldly cares may not obliterate the sense of the beauty which God has implanted in the human soul. Great, thank you. Next slide is a poem by Polly Murray. So as I said, Polly was a poet throughout their life, would use poetry to tend to the deep wounds, the deep trauma that Polly had to suffer as an intersectional minority in this country. We won't read this whole poem, but this is where the title Song in a Weary Throat comes from, um, that, that is so beautiful. I won't read it now because of time, but. Check out Dark Testament. There's a, there's a collection of poems that I handed out. Um, if you're a poet, if you love poetry, check out Holy Night. Next slide. Urban Homes. Um, Shelby. The, Ang the Anglican consciousness is intuitive, analogical, metaphorical, symbolic, and characteristic of poetry, art, and music. Ang Anglicanism is at its best. Its liturgy, its poetry, its music, and its life can create a world of wonder in which it is very easy to fall with God. The beauty of holiness helps us fall in love with God. And poetry is the <laughs> But I think that happens. Next slide. Thanks, Sarah. Moderation, something I struggle with. 
Um, but we try and be moderate. We don't do too much in excess. So Barb, this quote from Aristotle. Mm, okay, humankind acquires a particular quality by constantly acting a particular way. You become just by performing just actions, temperate by performing temperate actions, brave by performing brave actions. Thank Aristotle. You. Thank you. So we don't do too much or too little of something. We want that middle way that I think you've been talking about in these introductions uh, to the basics of Episcopal temperament. Next slide. Nature. Uh, many scholars think that if Pauli lived past 1985, they may have actually turned to environmental justice, caring for our Earth. The fifth mark of mission in the Episcopal Church is the love and care of God's creation. And we have this prayer from the Book of Common Prayer, which, Pauli, would you read this? this sure. My husband was fish and wildlife biologist for the forces. Awesome. And his birthday was just last week. Oh, awesome. So, awesome. Give us all a reverence for the earth as your own creation, the way we use its source resources rightly in the service of others, and to honor to your honor and glory. The book of common prayer. Thank you. Next slide. History. The most effective way to destroy people is to deny and obliterate their own understanding of their history. We know that indigenous peoples did not make it into the colonizers' history books, other than in really dehumanizing ways, and that there's stories to be told from the people who have their own histories, the people who impose their interpretation of those people's histories need to sit down and be quiet and let the people themselves tell us what their history is. <laughs> and and not, that song we had this morning, Christian history responsibility with the culture and and I during service I'd take a picture of it sent to my native friends up in Alaska and they they wrote back oh thanks for remembering us today yes you know, it was just uh, touching the gospel for, for some reason today you know the gospel hymn today yes yeah. thank you for me it, that text is beautiful and I'm so glad Richard chose that hymn yeah for today's so, uh, gospel hymn which was really good History, but next slide. Um, the history that Pauli Murray needed everyone to know in her own words are captured in her two histories, Proud Shoes, which talks about her grandparents' life because nobody really cared about black multicultural folk. Pauli wanted to preserve their own history. And in the Song and Weary Throat, obviously, towards the end of her life, wanted to be sure that she gets to tell her story and not get misinterpreted by people. Um, and history is part of the Episcopal tradition. You'd probably all be talking about Henry VIII and Elizabeth II. Sarah and I are fans of Elizabeth II. Oh, the first, Elizabeth the first. Sorry. Second is bad. <laughs> we share a little. Right. <laughs> that there's history behind how all of this developed in the Episcopal temperament, right? We have to go back to our historical stories to understand where this stuff comes from. Next slide. Antiquity. This is the history piece again. Uh, where are we, Mackenzie? Uh -huh. Christian antiquity is both Latin and Greek, both Western and Eastern. And the Anglican appeal to antiquity meant that Greek as well as Latin theology came to figure largely in the Anglican consciousness and in the work of the Anglican divines. So the orthodox, the sort of really earthy, visceral, embodied way of worshiping God, icons and incense and bells and smells and all of the beauty of engaging the five senses, that's very Eastern, right? And the Western is more sola scriptura, the word alone of God, right? So we try and balance that. And you will notice that in the liturgy. There's a liturgy of the word at the beginning. We hear the scriptures, we hear a sermon on the scriptures, and then there's that transition at the offertory where we get into that Eastern way of the liturgy at the table. Our senses are engaged, taste, touch, smell, sounds, all the senses are involved. So that's part of the antiquity, the history of where we come from. Next slide. Politics. As we know, Pauline Murray literally destroyed Jim Crow. 
And one part that I forgot to tell you, Ruth Bader Ginsburg, in her brief for the seventh, Title VII in the Civil Rights Act, where the word sex is added as a protected class for equal protection under the law, 14th Amendment, Pauli Murray is named as a co-author by Ruth Bader Ginsburg. And that word, sex, comes from all of Pauli Murray's argumentation at Howard University. So politics is deeply in Pauli's call to ministry as a faithful Christian. And you hear every, you know, we do this five times a year when we renew our baptismal covenant at St. John's. We say to the question, do you renounce the evil powers of this world which corrupt and destroy the creatures of God? I renounce them. Will you seek and serve Christ in all persons, loving your neighbor as yourself? I will, with God's help. Will you strive for justice and peace among all people and respect the dignity of every human being? I will, with God's help. So in the Book of Common Prayer 1979, which comes out of the 1960s civil rights movement, we've got this baptismal covenant in our tradition. Next slide. This is the final quote, and it's yours, Eliza. <laughs> In her writings and sermons, she reinterpreted biblical writings to show, through the stories of Eve, Hagar, and Mary, an alternative to the traditionally patriarchal readings of those texts. In the process, she laid the foundation for what became known as womanist theology, a theology attentive not only to the struggles of women of color, but also to the poorest among them. She used her identity as someone in between, someone who had trouble with boundaries, to serve as a bridge between white and black, male and female, rich and poor, believer and materialist, and to fight for the acceptance of all people society denigrated as different. Thank you. That's Polly Murray. So now we can have some conversation. <laughs> Unless, is there another slide? Nope. Oh, good. See, I remember this. Um, any aspects of the Episcopal temperament, remember them, they were comprehensiveness, ambiguity, open-mindedness, intuition, aesthetics, moderation, commitment to the natural care of the earth, um, historical, political, any of those aspects resonate with, we heard from Pauline, um, your late husband, committed to caring for the earth. Are there other aspects that you resonated with in this presentation? about the Episcopal temperament. And yeah, we can stop the share and we'll see if Katie's, yeah, Katie's, Katie is still there. Yeah, good. Anything that resonated for you or connected with your own story of faith, your own appreciation of the Episcopal church, um, how you find love and belonging in this community, the floor is yours. Yeah. Well, I, I liked when you said um, Episcopal Church or is about questions. Um, I was actually just talking to a friend. He's originally, his mother is Catholic. And he's always been like, I'm not a Christian. I'm not a Christian. So I asked him, I said, hmm. I was trying to ask him, like, why do you feel that way? You know? was it something about how you were brought up? And he said that in the Catholic church, they always tell you what to believe. And he didn't like that. And that he had been to some, you know, funeral services. He's gotten older, he had cancer. So he said that, he said, actually, he said, I, I really enjoyed, you know, like the music. And he goes, it was, it was giving me some, uh, you know, peace. He beat cancer, by the way. Was in his leg. He was my supervisor. Mm. Um, he is my supervisor, or he was my old supervisor, and he actually retired partly because of his cancer and left us in the dust during COVID. But, <laughs> but um, yes. Yeah, so I I wanted to tell him that, and I did mention the Episcopal Church to him. Invite him. Yes, I'm going to try. He might find love and belonging here, with all the questions. Right. He like yeah yeah, yeah. bring so. the questions. Thank you. Others? I would echo some of that as someone who was raised Catholic. Um, yeah, I can echo that, that it's often more you're, you're told you should think certain things or believe certain things. And if you don't, that there's a problem with that. And so I appreciate with this church, 
that there is the openness to questions and also ambiguity because I felt especially throughout my life I have struggled with faith and feeling like you had to have all the answers you had to have it all figured out and if you didn't there was a problem there like you weren't faithful enough or something along those lines mm -hmm. and I feel like the more that I've been here the more that it feels comfortable to sit in that ambiguity and not feel like I have to have it all figured out or that I'm somehow going to, you know, divine everything there is to know about God and faith. Um, and so, yeah, I appreciate those aspects of what the Episcopalian Church has in terms of belief. Great. Yeah. Thank you, Chris. Yeah, echoing what Chris has said, as someone who's in the process of converting from Catholicism, I know at least for me, when I got to like middle school, high school, and I started questioning things, I got very frustrated with the fact that when you bring up questions, you're trying to do more intuitive learnings of faith in the uh, Roman Catholic ch uh, Church, a lot of times you'll get pushed back against and I've gone through a couple of variations of Christianity, but a big thing that I mattered to me in terms of Catholicism, that I liked having some of the tradition, I liked having the choir and the community and the focus on text and not going completely casual, mm -hmm. but I also wanted there to be more flexibility and ability to question the church itself and to really take the faith and examine it and make it fit yourself versus you try to fit yourself to a faith that might not be perfect for you. Right. Thank you for sharing that, Sean. I'm a Roman Catholic. I well, was a Roman Catholic. I was born and raised, you know, first, first confession, first communion, confirmation. Um, was actually told by a deacon that I should go to the Jesuit seminary to become a Roman Catholic priest, which I took to heart, but that was way too much to think about at 16. But it was when I was at Indiana University that I was singing at an Episcopal church. And um, it was the sacramental beauty of all the liturgy that I loved as a child. But it was a woman priest who preached and celebrated the Eucharist and it completely changed my mind. And um, yeah, we've at least the, the small c Catholic liturgical elements grounded in scripture, everything comes out of scripture in the liturgy, um, is, is something that I still find deep meaning in. So thank you. Other comments or reflections on? Oh, this made me think of our, our the middle of our three daughters who probably has the largest I, she has a very big social consciousness, and I always thought that she would be, among our three kids, I thought oh, she would be really drawn to being a spiritual leader, and we were going to a Lutheran church at the time, and she was in confirmation, and she lasted about three sessions, and it was because they were, inquiry was not welcome. Wow. Uh, and, and by profession, she is professionally she has an academic job and that one thing turned her off to um, organized religion she was married in the episcopal church however okay and continues to live her values so it's not her place right now but it might be later yeah well um, i hope she keeps questioning Polly Mari, if Polly Mari didn't keep asking why women couldn't be priests, why women can't read, why women can't be deacons, why can't women celebrate the Eucharist, the Episcopal Church would never mm -hmm. have made that decision at St. Mark's Episcopal Cathedral in Minneapolis, mm -hmm. 1977, General Convention. Mm -hmm. All people are have access to the mm -hmm. sacrament of holy orders. So I do look at Polly Mur Murray's life too, and I think how different her life played out because her aunt Pauline mm -hmm. saw in her mm -hmm. a broader possibility than were conventional social norms at the time. Yes. Mm -hmm. Yes. Um, and so props to Aunt Pauline for seeing the value in that child. 
yeah. and the yeah. spirit in her child. Because yeah. not all of us are going to be Paulies, but pretty much any of us can be a Pauline. <laughs> yes. 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 Pauline. Yeah. And Aunt Pauline, I mean, they were, the other part here is Pauline grew up poor. Yes. Pauline was hungry every day of her life until she became a professor at Brandeis in her 70s. Mm -hmm. wow. mm -hmm. And living in poverty, Pauline was a school teacher and would bring Pauline because there was no white babysitting. Pauline learned how to read ahead of everyone because she sat in on Pauline's classroom and had to be quiet. <laughs> um, but yeah, the freedom that Aunt Pauline gave Pauline to be who you are and be that well um, really liberated that trust in her auntie uh, to, to be who she is. Who they and are. in that time, you know, if you think about in that time, that was, it was not unusual for families to take in children that had, were in need. But in that time, that was a very unusual mindset. And her aunt Pauline was Episcopal, or what? The whole family cradle Episcopalians. There's the, the Black image where Episcopalians you in the South. Yes, oh, in wow. in North Carolina. So yeah. the picture of Pauline Murray in the chasuble as a priest. The church that Pauline is in is the church she was baptized in as an Episcopalian mm -hmm. uh, in North Carolina. Which there's a long story about how that Episcopal church was this bizarre place where different people of different races worshiped, especially during Jim Crow. It's just read my, a song, song and Weird Road. Mm -hmm. Yeah. I know, yes. It looks like Kate might have a hand raised. Oh, Katie, go ahead. Did we mute her? Oh, where is she? I'm trying to figure out, can y'all see and hear me? Yes. 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 <laughs> Um, oh, here I've got my second. Katie, maybe turn off your screen, uh, but keep your sound on because you're breaking up. Okay. Yeah. Is that any better? I yes. can hear you. Yes. 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 Um, I just really appreciate the Polly Murray documentary and thinking about how I was able to connect with a lot of people in my life who don't feel connected to any kind of church and actually feel like really burned by churches, whether that's my employee who grew up on the streets of Chicago or my best friend who is trans and doesn't want anything to do with church, but it was neat for me to be able to share this documentary with them and also share sort of the faith journey that I'm on right now and have it not be gross to them, but um, them just being open to it. And yeah, not something that they want to be a part of, but in terms of loving community and understanding people has been really meaningful and something that we can share together. That's beautiful, Katie. Thank you. That means a lot to me. Polly Murray was also the reason why I thought I could belong in this church. Thank you. Katie. And especially as somebody um, who works in the homeless community, just seeing her ride the rails and do that badass shit. Excuse my language. <laughs> yes. That was pretty cool too. <laughs> when she, when Polly called herself the dude or the imp, yeah, those days were radical. I would have loved That's, to know Polly when she was riding the trains. Yeah, because I got I got employees who are riding the trains right now, but in a much different way. And yeah, just super radical. Thanks, Katie. Time-wise, are we over? Are we we over? are a little. Sorry, sorry to let that. people go. Um, sorry. It's okay, but we can we can always continue these conversations um, next week, or you know, if you want to, um, our clergy are always happy to go have coffees and have more conversations. So please reach out to Craig if you've enjoyed this conversation. You want to carry them on, and we do do lots of.
formation here at St. John's because as Craig said, we encourage these kinds of discussions. So there's lots of, there's always lots of formation going on here. So um, the little cards are out, pick things up, um, of things you wanna come to, check out the website. There's always lots of stuff going on. Um, next week, we'll be back here again, 11.30. Um, we have Karen Mosso. Um, Karen Mosso is a parishioner. She's also a retired uh, Episcopal priest. And uh, she volunteers to always teach one of these classes whenever we do them. And she is going to be um, talking about Episcopal worship and spirituality. Um, so she'll be joining us next week to do that. Um, so we hope you'll be back for more discussion uh, with Karen. Any Think before we close. I just had one idea that I, I know we're closing the discussion, no, but maybe just for people to reflect on during the week. Um, so Craig, you were saying that we don't do binaries in our Episcopal tradition and temperament. Um, and yet I think binaries shape our experience of the world and even how we structure language. And so I wondered if we might individually or collectively reflect on what is productive about the binaries, you know, like in colliding opposites what do we create what what kind of space can open up as um we oppose or connect different ideas the, the boundaries the, yeah the, the edge of the borders the yeah. liminal spaces mm -hmm. in between yes because even if you look at the life of Polly murray there's a way in which we are claiming her as a woman in order to call attention to and exclusion and therefore produce um, a new set of possibilities for inclusion. Uh, and yet that's not who they were exactly. Yes. yes. Um, so I think sometimes these binaries are productive even as they confine us. Yeah. Working with within the system that is to create something mm -hmm. new. Yeah. Very thank you for that, Mackenzie. Yeah. Yeah. Anything else before Thank you for being here. Thank you all. Thank you. Have a good week. Yes, blessings on your week. Watch.